Abraham experienced it and his name was changed. Sarah experienced it and she got laughter. Moses experienced it and he went from hiding to leading. David experienced it and became God's beloved. Elijah experienced it and brought down fire. A savior has come to you. A healer has come to you. A deliverer has come to you. A redeemer has come to you. You will not miss your miracle. Now, it's your time. Experience the supernatural in this month's Global Crusade themed The Glorious Visitation of Christ happening live in Ghana. God is ready to move. Also featuring our ministers, church workers, and professional conference team enabling grace and power for the end time harvest. The youth aren't left behind as they are moving upward to higher heights with the Impact Academy. Join us from the 28th to 25th of April at Independence Square, Osu, Accra. The word of power would be broadcast worldwide through satellite, radio, TV, and the GCK social media platforms. We will be blessed by glorious music from choirs around the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Bible study. Thank you because we know you are mightily present with us. And we pray, Lord, that you teach us in your word, lead us into the truth, help us to so know you that we will want to follow after the word you are teaching us. Help us that this study will not be just like any other study, just like any other person speaking to us, but it will be that you, the Almighty God, will speak to every heart. And you lead us in the way of righteousness. Make us better in our relationship with you, in obedience to you, and in the way we react, respond to your word. Be with us, Lord, and grant us your spirit understanding so that we'll be able to understand the deep things of the word of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. We're looking at Jonah today. And last week we looked at Jonah chapter 1 verse 17. Now we're going to chapter 2 from verse 1 all through to verse 9. Jonah chapter 2 verse 1. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. Then Jonah prayed. That word then marks the time. It means something had happened. After that thing happened, then this other thing happened. Look at verse 17, chapter 1. Now, the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed. As we connect those two verses together, the last verse of chapter 1 and the first verse of chapter 2, you then begin to ask the question, why did God prepare a great fish to swallow up Jonah? Number one is to rescue Jonah from drowning. Jonah told the people, pick me up and throw me into the sea and then there will be calmness for you. And then they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea. Without God preparing a great fish to swallow him up, he would have drowned. Therefore, number one, God prepared that great fish uh, so that he would rescue Jonah from drowning. Number two is to reach Jonah's heart. To reach Jonah's heart. Because at this time, his heart was hardened. He made up his mind. He was going to rebel against the word of the Lord. He was going to reject the calling of God upon his life. And God needed to reach out to his heart. Number two then is to reach Jonah's heart. Number three, to reveal his love for Nineveh. That I will not give up. My love for Nineveh is still there and is still strong. And because I want this word, the word of warning, and the word of witness, and the word to win them out of their evil, and win them unto the side of the Lord. Therefore, I said, Jonah, I'm not giving up on you because I love Nineveh so much to reveal his love for Nineveh. Number three, to return, number four, to return Jonah to Nineveh. He was going the wrong direction, and the Lord wanted to return him to the place he wanted him, to the destination of his assignment. 
And for that purpose, that is to return Jonah to Nineveh. That's the reason why God prepared a great fish to swallow him up. Number five is to recommission Jonah for service. To recommission him for service. We'll find out when the fish dropped Jonah at the spot, it ought to drop him. Then you'll find the commission came again. The word of the Lord came unto Jonah. The second time saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it. The preaching that I bid thee. Then number six is to restore Jonah's lost ministry. He lost the ministry. And if uh, we leave it in his hand alone, he'll never recover that ministry. But you see the love of God working on his heart. I want him to get back to that ministry. Number seven is to remind Jonah of God's supremacy. That God is all in all. And God can do all things he wants to do. And nobody can successfully resist the absolute will of God. As we go through those seven points, isn't that what God does for us? Because in judgment, he remembers mercy. Because even though he might rebuke us, and he ought to rebuke us, and he will rebuke us whenever we go astray. He is not an indulgent father, he is a good father. And he's a pure father, a perfect father. And he wants his children to go the right direction. Therefore, when we're going astray, he will chastise us. He will prune us. And he will correct us. And he lead us in the right direction. And yet, he will rescue us from drowning. Drowning in the sea of confusion. And drowning and being overwhelmed with the sorrow and the problems that we have. Number two, he wants to reach our heart. That he even though he might discipline us, chastise us, correct us, point the way to us, is going to reach our heart. Everything he does during the time of correction, during the time of rebuke, during the time of chastisement, is to reach our heart. And he's still saying, my son, my daughter, give me your attention and give me your heart. I have a work for you to do. You are not listening. Pay, pay attention. Number three, he wants to reveal his love for the people we ought to be reaching. While we are folding our hands and closing our mouth and standing still and not doing the work of God, it says the people I'm sending you to, they are not going to live forever. And you need to minister to them. And it's revealing his love to those people. That's why he's calling us back. Number four is to return us to the place of ministry. You see, when God rebukes us, when God chastises us, when God corrects us, it is not to destroy us. It's to make us turn and come back into that ministry. Number five is to recommission us. And it's not going to recommission us until you'll see it in the life of Jonah. Until we yield like Jonah yielded. Until we surrender like Jonah surrendered. And the Lord is not going to go halfway. Whatever he wants to do, he does see it to perfection. When God wants to correct, he corrects to perfection. And when God, what God wants to return us to the place we ought to be, he does see it until it is achieved. He doesn't play a half-hearted game. He goes all the way through so that until we get to that place, he's not going to leave us alone until he can recommission us according to his standard. And according to the condition of his word, he will not leave us alone. He's to restore us into the lost ministry. Don't you know? Every time a servant of the Lord is under discipline, he's losing the ministry. It's not a ministry at that time. And the Lord deals with him, and he deals with him in various ways. He can use, we learned it last week, he has all the resources in his hand. So that he will use all those resources to restore us back unto ministry and then to remind us that God is all in all that God is supreme that no man can successfully effectively resist the will of God successfully run away from God he wants to prove to us that God can do all things at all times to anyone in all places in any generation he reminds us again of his supremacy now we come to Jonah chapter 2 I'm reading from verse 1 again then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God, 
out of the fish's belly and said i cried by reason of my affliction unto the lord and he heard me out of the belly of hell cried i and thou heardest my voice for thou hast called me into the deep into the midst of the seas and the floods compassed me about all thy billows and thy waves passed over me then said i then i said i am cast out of thy sight Yet I will look again toward thy holy temple, the waters compassed me about. Even to the soul, the death closed me round about, and the weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet as thou brought me brought up my life from corruption O Lord my God when my soul fainted within me I remembered the Lord and my prayer came in unto thee into thine holy temple day that observed line vanities forsake their own mercy but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving I will pay that that I have vowed salvation is of the Lord verse 10 and the Lord spake unto to the fish and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land after Jonah had been thrown into the depths of the sea then we're told in that verse 1 Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God it's unfortunate actually that he did not pray at the right time he should have prayed before this time but thank God eventually he prayed even, even when we might have missed praying in the past, if like Jonah, we will eventually pray, God will definitely answer as he answered the prayer of Jonah. Now, you know, the nature of man remains the same. The attitude of man remains the same. And the reactions of man remains the same. I'm sure many of us say, I'm married and you have children, especially little, little children. Are we not like little children? In the sight of the Almighty God, he is the ancient of days. And we are just men and women of yesterday, like little, little children. Don't you know, sometimes you are correcting your children. And the first time you correct the child, the child is going to act as sheep. Why is daddy doing that? Why is mommy doing that? And the child is not going to have immediate response to that correction. The child is first of all going to continue in rebellion. And then if daddy and mommy, if they remain firm, and they say, boy, you can't grow up like this, a rebel. You can't grow up like this, a little monster in the family. You must have correction. And we're doing that because we love you. And when that child sees that daddy and mommy will not bend, will not bulge, then eventually that child might begin to actually show some attitude and some action of repentance. That's exactly what happened to Jonah. When he was going astray from the Lord, and the Lord then was saying, why are you doing this? And then there was a storm. It's like, you know, Jonah and Jehovah fighting together. It's like, okay, Jehovah, if you do that, this is what I will do. I've made up my mind. I'm not going to obey you. Do whatever you want. And therefore, God continued. You're not going to change God. You're not going to bend God. And you're not going to twist the hands of God. If Jonah continues, God is going to continue the storm. And God is going to continue the, uh, the chastisement because God has a goal. God has a purpose. And God has a plan. And that plan, he will fulfill. Eventually when, uh, you know, the people said, what are we going to do to you, Jonah? Because he just told us now that you and God, that Jonah and Jehovah, they're having a conflict a controversy and you are telling us that you know there's nothing to do you don't even want to repent while you are here in the in the boat in the ship because if you can repent here if the lord directs us to take you right to that border of Nineveh will take you there says don't worry about that just throw me out and then I'll set you with that almighty God and then God said all right I'll set you with you too and then the fish swallowed him up and then realized this 
uh, game will continue for a long time except I do something. Because God says, I am God, I change not. If anybody is going to change, it's man that will change. The Bible will not change. Its standard will not change. Its calling will not change. Its demand will not change. Its commandment will not change. If anything is going to change, man will have to change. And then Jonah eventually prayed. And when he prayed, then God answered him. And if it happens to you like that, you are, you know, a member of the church, you are a child in the family, and then something God is saying, why did you do this? Why did you do this? Why don't you do it like this? Look at my calling for you. And maybe you rebel to the point that he even chastises you. You, re you rebel that he even tried to correct you. Maybe you were fighting before. That fight will continue with the Almighty God until you bend, because God will not bend, and God will not change, and the demand will not change, and the requirement of God will not change until you pray like Jonah. Nothing else will change. You'll be going from bad to worse, from the boat into the sea, from the sea into the whale's belly. And then we're told, the moment he prayed, the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. In chapter 1, we were edge of Jonah sleeping. While the mariners were praying unto their gods, he knew that his rebellion and refusal to go and preach was responsible for the raging of the storm. But he never preached, he never called upon the Lord his God that he now preached after he had been dropped into the sea shows that he saw what had happened as God's remedial action to bring him back to submission and an acceptance of the preaching assignment. You see, our prayers depend on how we interpret the actions of God in our lives. If we misinterpret the actions of God in our lives, we're going to take the wrong side. We're going to behave the wrong way. If you misinterpret the action of your parents over you, you're going to react as you're interpreting the reaction. But if you interpret it aright and say, yes, I understand, God loves me. And God loves Nineveh. And God is actually saying, give, my, give your best unto me. I gave my best unto you. Now you must give me your best. The moment you interpret the actions of God correctly, then you are going to behave in the right way. He realized that this was just God's remedial action to bring him back to submission, bring him back to acceptance of the preaching assignment. And therefore, he prayed. And when he prayed, then God answered him. I pray God will answer you. Yeah. And then what happened to Jonah? That is the favor of God. That he is fellowship he had with God eventually. And then eventually, the assignment that came back to him, I pray it will come back to you in Jesus' name. Yeah. We're looking at the message under three subtitles. Number one is complaint in distress. Is complaint in distress. Number two is confession and decision. Then number three we have is consecration and deliverance. Let's come to number one. Is complaint in distress. Let's look at Jonah chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, and then we'll go to verse 6. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God, out of the fish's belly, and said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of, the, of hell, I cried I. And thou heardest my voice, for thou hast cast me into the deep, in the, in, in the midst of the seas. And the floods compassed me about, all the billows and thy waves passed over me. Verse 6, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever, yet as thou brought, me, brought up my life from corruption O oh Lord, my God. As you look at the subtitle, is complaint in distress. When we say it's complaint, number one, is not to accuse God or man. You see, when we have a problem, whatever we are telling God, O oh Lord, I'm sorrowful. O oh Lord, I'm unhappy. O oh Lord, things are turning upside down. Yes, it's prayer, but it's our complaint unto the Almighty God. I'll show you now in the Bible. 
when other people also opened up and told God their affliction, their sorrow, their suffering, their pressure, the oppression upon them. But the complaint, number one, was not to accuse God or man. Number two, not to argue with God or man. You see, when we're in a terrible situation and then we're going through some pressure, some, uh, some real chastisement from the Lord, uh, you might be accusing God or accusing man. Or you might be arguing with God or arguing with man. In the case of Jonah, it was not like that. Number three, it was not to abuse God or abuse man. You see, there are people, when they come into situations like that, they abuse. They abuse man, they insult man. They blaspheme God. But in the case of Jonah, he was not accusing, he was not arguing, he was not abusing. Number four, it was not to abandon God. All right, God, if it's like that, take your thing and I go my way. I even need time to do whatever I want to do. And, uh, oh God, you have other people, go on and do whatever you want to do. It wasn't to abandon God, neither to abandon his responsibility towards men. Number five, it was not to attack God or man. Not to fight God or man. You see, all these things help us as we see people, flesh and blood like ourselves. People of like passions as we are. When they got into trouble, when they got under the chastening rod of the Lord, here is the way they acted. Here is the way they responded. Here is the thing that they did. They did. And they will be able to do the same. Not to attack, not to fight God or man. And number six, not to be arrogant before God or man. You see, there are people, it's at that time you see the corrupt nature really coming or showing itself. It's at that time you see pride, you see haughtiness, and you see being pompous, you see being arrogant. In the case of Jonah, he said, uh uh, this is not the time for pride, this is not the time for haughtiness, this is not the time for arrogance. And then number seven, not to arouse others against God not to instigate others against God. You see, there are people, when they are being chastised for disobedience or for rebellion, then they arouse others to rebel. They arouse others. They instigate others to rebel. And they say, prove to him that I'm not the only bad person. I'm not the only bad egg in a basket. Prove to him that all of us are the same. And prove to him that if you put down one, you have to put down everybody because everybody is just going to rebel like I've rebelled. Prove to him that we're all the same. No, he was not instigating others. He was not allowing others to rebel or to, uh, or to disobey the Almighty God. In his complaint, what was he doing? Number one, he acknowledged his sin before God. It was to acknowledge I'm the one that went wrong. I forsook the right way. I didn't do the right thing. Number two, to abase self before the Almighty God. If you abase yourself, then the Lord will lift you up. But if you are proud and you lift up yourself, then the Lord will abase you. Number one, he acknowledged his sin before the Lord. Number two, he abased himself. Number three, he asked for God's mercy. Asking for God's mercy. That's what we do. When you are laying your complaint before the Lord. And when you are telling the Lord, oh Lord, this is how I am. And this is who I am. I am sorry for what has happened. And then you are asking for the mercy of God. Number four, you are agreeing to serve God. You agree. You agree to serve God. Oh Lord, now in my complaint before you, I know what brought me to this. Now I agree to serve God. Number five, to abstain from further appearance of sin or disobedience. To abstain. From further appearance of sin or disobedience. You see, when the Lord is correcting you for something, and then you are saying, Oh Lord, I surrender. Oh Lord, I yield myself. Then you must prove to God that your prayer is real, your prayer is genuine, because you abstain from further appearance of sin and disobedience. Number six, you awake and act positively. Awake and act positively. You will not be passive. Well, I'm here. I'm there, but I won't do anything. I won't say anything. I'll keep my personality. 
I'll keep my pride. I will keep my stature. I'll keep who I am. I'll not say anything or do anything. Because if I say anything, they may interpret it for weakness. And they may interpret it for as if I'm begging. As if I'm telling God, oh God, this is too much. Ah, I'm not going to do that with God. I want God to respect me that I keep my personality. I have a strong mind, a strong will. You are awake and your heart positively. You'll not be passive when the Lord is saying, Jonah, you're going the wrong way and I want you to go the right way. You are awake and you act positively. Number seven, you admonish others to serve God acceptably. You admonish others. Jonah, ac admonish others, advise others, instruct others, and lead others to serve the Lord acceptably. So, when we use the word complaint is complaint in distress. Please don't misunderstand. In Second Samuel chapter 22, Second Samuel chapter 22, I'm reading from verse 5. When the waves of death compassed me, the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me in my distress. I called upon the Lord and, call, and cried to my God. And he did hear my voice out of his temple. And my cry did enter into his ears. And this writing about this, talking about David. You see what happened to Jonah and happened to all the people before him and happened to all the people at time he had, he had David spoke about his distress in my distress I called upon the Lord I cried unto my God he was a king but then he acted the right way when he was in distress he called upon the name of the Lord in Psalm 25 Psalm 25 I'm reading from verse 15 Psalm 25 verse 15 Mine eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. Turn thee unto me, and have mercy upon me, for I am desolate and afflicted. My troubles of, the troubles of my heart are enlarged. I bring thou, O oh bring thou me out of my distresses. Again, you see here David talking about his own distress. And was appealing to God. He was asking from God. He was praying unto the Lord. That the Lord would bring him out of distress. Do you remember I told you that when these people in Bible days. When they were laid their complaints before the Lord. They were not accusing God. And they were not, uh, uh, they were not arguing with God. They knew it was their fault they got into the distress. And it was their fault they got into that affliction. And all they wanted is, so God, show mercy on me so that I'll come out of this distress. I'll come out of this difficulty. We're looking at Psalm 107. Psalm 107, verse 11. Because they rebelled against the words of God and contempt the counsel of the Most High. Therefore, he brought, them, he brought down their heart with labor. You see the reason why? Now, God is not interested in chastising anybody, rebuking anybody, and putting affliction or distress in anybody's life. There, there's a reason for it. And anytime you get into such a thing, then you ask yourself, what reason is there for me to go through what I'm going through? Because the earlier you realize, and the earlier you solve the problem, and the earlier you come before the Lord and say, Lord, I surrender. I give myself to you. You see, the time of uh, discipline, or the time of chastisement, or the, the time of being in the whale's belly, or the time of being in the cooler, as people say, or the time of being abandoned and just set aside, it's not the time of continued rebellion. It's the time of saying, Lord, I'm waking up. I'm waking up. I realize what has happened, and because I realize this is the right step I'm going to take now, I was wrong. I did not do right. I rebelled against the word of God. I rebelled against the will of God because they rebelled against the words of God and contempt the counsel of the Most High. Therefore, he brought down their hearts with labor. They fell under and there was none to help. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble and he saved them out of their distresses. Look at verse 17. Fools, because of their transgression, 
fools because of their transgression and because of their iniquities afflicted. Their soul abhorreth all manner of meat, and they draw near unto the gates of death. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saveth them out of their distresses. He saveth them out of their distresses. Verse 25. For he commandeth and raineth the stormy wind, and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heaven. They go down again to the depths, and their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like, drunk, like a drunken man, and at their wits' end, then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses, he maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. Uh, you see it all over in that psalm telling us that this is the reason the problem came, and this is the way it's going to get away by crying unto the Lord and crying and calling upon the name of the Lord in Second Chronicles chapter 33. Second Chronicles chapter 33, I'm reading verses 12 and 13. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God. Uh, that's talking about Manasseh. When he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God. Listen to me. There's nothing that happens to any of us today, to you or to me, that has not happened to somebody before. Uh, there's no chastisement coming upon anybody today that didn't come on somebody else before. And there is no withdrawal of God's favor that happens to any of us today that has not happened unto somebody before. When that withdrawal of favor and when that chastisement from the heavy hand of the Lord came upon them, what did they do? Are we going to spend 2,000 years in vain, not learning anything for these 2,000 years? Are we going to spend 3,000 years, 4,000 years in human experience between God and the Almighty, between God and man? Are we going to have all that period of time, 3,000 3, years, I mean, a 1,000 years before Christ, 2,000 years before Christ, added to the 2,000 years after Christ, many, many things that happened to people, how they sought the favor of God, how they sought the mercy of God, are we going to allow all that period of seeking the favor of God, and these men and women that went before us, and they received the favor of God, the forgiveness of God, and the love of God again, are we not going to learn anything from that? You see, this man, say, he went astray before the Lord, and the Lord chastised him, and he was in affliction. When he was in affliction, he sought the Lord as God, and he humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and he prayed unto him and he was entreated of him and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom he brought him again into his kingdom but not until he humbled himself that's how God deals with man and the earlier we learn the method of God, the earlier we learn the purpose of God, the earlier we learn the way God normally acts, the better for us, because he has, he has told us 4,000 years ago, that's how he did it, and 3,000 years ago, that's how he did it, 2,000 years ago, that's exactly how he did it, and today, that's exactly how he's still doing it, because it doesn't change. It's not going to increase in wisdom. It's not going to increase in love. It's not going to increase in power. It's ever the same. What he did before, he's still doing today. And therefore, man is supposed to learn. In all these years of Jehovah dealing with Jonah, we're looking at Psalm, uh, Psalm 130. Psalm 130. I'm reading to you from verses 1 and 2. Psalm 130. Psalm 130, verses 1 and 2. Out of the depths I have cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. See what they did? That's how they got out of trouble. And then in Lamentation chapter 3. Lamentation chapter 3, we're looking at verse 54. Lamentation chapter 3, looking at verse 54. What has flowed over my head? Then, said, then I said, I am cut off. I called upon thy name, O Lord, out of the low dungeon. 
you see, uh, uh, we're coming from the time of uh, Second Chronicles. Then we came into the time of the Psalms. And now we're going to the time of Jeremiah, Lamentations of Jeremiah. And this is the testimony, uniform testimony of the scripture. That when you're in a low dungeon, when you're in predicament, and when you're under chastisement, the thing to do is to call upon the name of the Lord. And you call with all humility of mind. And with all sobriety you call upon the Lord. And then he said in verse 57, Thou drewest near in the day that I called upon thee. And thou says, Fear not. And then he says in verse 58, O Lord, thou hast pleaded the causes of my soul. Thou hast redeemed my life. We'll go back to the Psalms in Psalm 142. Psalm 142. And I'm reading from verse 1. In Psalm 142, reading from verse 1, here is the testimony of Scripture again. It tells us, I cried unto the Lord with my voice. With my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my complaint. I poured out my complaint before him. I showed before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knewest my path in the way wherein I walked. A day privily laid a snare for me. I looked on my, on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. In verse 5, I cried unto thee, O Lord. I cried. I cried unto thee, O Lord. Psalm 88, I'm reading from verse 1. Psalm 88, I'm reading from verse 1. After reading all these many references of scriptures, then we have no excuse. We know how to get out of trouble. It's just to call upon the Lord. It says in Psalm 88, verse 1, O Lord God of my salvation, I have cried. I have cried day and night before thee. Let my prayer come before thee. Incline thine ear unto my cry, for my soul is full of troubles, and my life draweth nigh unto the grave. I am, I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that has no strength, free among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, whom thou rememberest no more, and they are cut off from thy hand. Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, and in the deeps. Thy wrath lies hard upon me, and thou hast afflicted me all uh, with all thy waves. Just like Jonah, just like Jonah, crying, out, crying unto the Lord. Psalm 116, 116, Psalm 116, what did he do from verse 3? The sorrows of death compass me. And the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. Of the Lord, O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low, and he helped me return unto thy rest, to my soul. For the Lord has dealt bountifully with thee. For thou has delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. The Lord will do it for us. We go to Job chapter 33. Job. We're looking at chapter 33 of Job, and we're looking at it from verse 22. Job 33 from verse 22. Yea, his soul draweth near unto the grave, his life to the destroyers. If there be a messenger with him, an interpreter, one among a thousand to show unto man his uprightness, then he is gracious unto him. Don't, don't pass those two verses without understanding. Uh, here we're, we're learning something. It says a man is going through some real challenges. Some real problems, some real pressures, some real pain, some real chastisement. If there be a messenger with him, an interpreter, one among a thousand that will show unto man how his relationship had been with the Almighty God, open his eyes to see. Open his heart to conceive and to perceive and to understand. And open his spirit for him to see, yes, now I see. 
you interpreter. You have interpreted the condition between me and God, and you have, re- you have seen it arise. You have seen what I'm going through, and you are giving me the proper interpretation. I was not looking at it like that before, but now that you have interpreted it to me, let me go and seek the face of the Lord. You see, we need interpreters. Interpreters of the word of God and interpreters of the dealings of God with us. But you see, it says, an interpreter one in a thousand. One in a thousand. Many people are not interpreters of God's dealings with us. They will be saying, well, it happens to everybody. Everybody will pass through that once in a while. Don't worry about it. It will soon pass. Those are not good interpreters. But when somebody comes to you, and he looks at what is happening to you. And he says, my brother, I've been praying for you. And I've been thinking about you. And we've been missing you, we'll be, Jonah. We've been missing your prophetic ministry. Can we interpret this to you, Jonah? Do you understand why God is doing this? Do you see the love of God for you? And then do you see the interpretation of what is happening to you? Then Jonah will see. There was nobody there in the whale's belly to interpret to Jonah, but the Spirit of God did what man could not do, interpreted the situation to him. You need that interpreter in your life. And don't shut up the interpreter. And don't close the mouths of the interpreter. Don't say, get away from me. I don't want to hear that. I know, I know what's happening. Leave me. I'm wise. Don't say that. Let them interpret to you because it's only then in verse 24. Then he is gracious unto him and says, deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. I have found a ransom. His flesh shall be fresher than a child's. He, he shall return to the days of his youth. He shall pray unto God, and it will be favorable unto him. And he shall see his face with joy, for he will rain down to man his righteousness. He looketh upon men, and if any say, if the interpreter has interpreted correctly, and the person now will say, I have sinned, and perverted that which was right, and it profited me not. He will deliver his soul from going into the pit, and his life shall see the light. Lo, all these things walketh God often times with man. You see that? All these things walketh God often times with man. Uh, you know, the interpreter is telling us that's how God acts. That's how God does. It's a righteous God. And he wants righteousness. And if he has any controversy with us, it's because he wants to return us unto the path of righteousness. Psalm 143. I'm reading verses 7 and 8. Psalm 143, verse 7, verse 8. Hear me speedily, O Lord, my spirit faileth. Hide not thy face from me, lest I be like unto them that go down into the pit. Cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning, for in thee do I trust. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk, for I lift up my soul unto thee. Yeah, that's, that's the dealing of God with man, and I pray God will give us wisdom. Yeah. I come to point number two, is confession and decision. Is confession and decision. We're coming to Jonah. In Jonah, we're looking at chapter 2 and chapter 2, reading from verse 4. Jonah, chapter 2, verse 4. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. Verse 5, the water has compassed me about, even to the soul, uh, the depths close me round about the weeds were wrapped about my head i went down to the bottoms of the mountains the earth with her bars was about me forever yet as thou brought up my life from corruption O lord my god as you look at verse four you see two things there number one you see confession number two you see decision look at verse four again then said I, I am cast out of thy sight. That's a confession. It was confessing, this is my condition. This is my predicament. This is my trouble. This was this pain in me at heart. I am cast out of thy sight. But then you now see the decision. Yet, I will look again toward thy 
holy temple. And those two sides will always be there. You confess to start with, and then you make a decision. You say, yes, I know this is my condition now. This is what I'm going through now. And then you make a decision, yet I will. And let's look at the confession to start with, and then we're also going to look at the decision. We're going back to the Psalms in Psalm 69. Psalm 69, we're reading from verse 1. Psalm 69, reading from verse 1. In verse 1, save me, O God, for the waters are come in unto my soul. That's the confession. The waters have come into my soul. It's reaching down deep to the way, to the place it hurts me, to the place I cannot keep quiet anymore. The sin is touching my heart and touching my soul and touching my mind. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I am calm into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I am weary of my crying. My throat is dry. My eyes fail while I I wait for my God. That's the confession in Psalm 88. Psalm 88. In Psalm 88, we're looking at verses 6 and 7. Thou hast led me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the deeps. Thy wrath lies hard upon me, and thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves. That's the confession. Uh, oh Lord, see what you've done to me and really it's paining me now and I cannot stay under this. That's the confession. You see, first there's a confession. Confession of sin, confession of the situation in which you find yourself, confession of the sorrow, confession of the sickness and con con confession of your condition in general in Psalm 40 verses 12 and 13, the confession. Psalm 40 verses 12 and 13. For innumerable evils have compassed about me. Innumerable evils have compassed me about. What did I think in that wrong direction? What did I take that wrong decision? Why did I go in a direction that wasn't according to the will of God? Innumerable evils, as I think about it now, have compassed me about. My iniquities have taken hold upon me, confession, so that I am not able to look up. They are more than the ears of my head. Therefore, my heart faileth me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. You see how other people, how they got out of trouble? They confessed before the Lord. And then when they said, oh Lord, this is my condition, then they said, this is my uh, decision as well. In Psalm 42, verse 6. Psalm 42, verse 6. Psalm 42, verse 6. Oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. That's confession. Look at the decision. Therefore, I will remember thee from the land of Jordan. I will remember thee still. I will not forget. I'm still going to serve you. That's the decision. You see, when you make a confession, that's not enough. You must come to a decision. Job chapter 13, verse 15. Decision. Decision. Job chapter 13, verse 15. Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. Yet I will. That's decision. This is happening to me, yet I will serve the Lord. This has happened to me, yet I will follow the Lord. This has come upon me more than I can bear, yet I will worship the Lord. That's the decision that the Lord wants us to take in Psalm 71. Psalm 71, verses 10 and 11. For my enemies speak against me, and they that lay wait for me, for my soul, have taken counsel together, saying, God has forsaken him. Persecute and take him, for there is none to deliver him. That's what they are saying. They are thinking, all is gone. What would they have been thinking about Jonah at this time? When it appeared, there's nobody to help. He had been thrown into the sea. What's happening to him now? There is no help for him. And then you find that the man still taking him from verse 14. But I will hope continually. 
But I will hope continually. You see, there's a confession on the one hand. There's decision on the other hand. It says, yet will I praise thee more and more. My mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day. For I know not the numbers thereof. I will go in, in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness, even of thine only. That's the decision. You see the many times it says, yet I will. I will. I will. You see, that's the decision the Lord was expecting from Jonah. That this is happening to me. Confession. Yet I will serve the Lord. And we're looking at Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17, verse 18. Habakkuk chapter 3, then from verse 17 and verse 18. Remember what we are talking about, that although this is happening, which we confess, which we reveal, which we talk to God about, then we make up our minds, our decision, yet I will. In Habakkuk chapter, chapter 3, verse 17, although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be on the vines, and the labor of the holy shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat, the flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. You see the confession there? It says things are dry. There's poverty. There's scarcity. There is need. It's like the Lord has abandoned us. It's like nothing is moving at all. Look at verse 18, the decision. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Yet I will. Yet I will. You see, your prayers not finished after you have said, Oh Lord, look at this and look at this and look at this and look at that. You continue the prayer to come to a decision, a point of decision. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. We're looking at Psalm 123, verses 2 to 4. Psalm 123, I will. The decision that the Lord wants us to take after we see his hand, heavy hand, upon us. Psalm 123, I'm reading from verse 2. Behold, as the eyes of the servants look unto the hand of their masters, and as the eyes of the maiden unto the hand of her mistress, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God until that he have mercy upon us. Do you remember what Jonah said? Please come back to Jonah. I'm still coming back to that Psalm 123, but I want to link up that Psalm 123 with Jonah chapter 2, where we're studying now. Look at Jonah chapter 2, verse 4. It says, Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. Yet I will look again. And look at it now in Psalm 123, verse 2. Behold, as the eyes of the servants look unto the hand of their masters, and as the eyes of a maiden unto the, unto the hand of her mistress, so our eyes wait upon thee, our God, until thou, until that he have mercy upon us. You see, the psalmist was saying, I'll be looking the right direction now. I'll be looking unto the almighty God, and I'll keep on looking at God. Praying unto God, waiting upon God, expecting from God until he will have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord. Have mercy upon us. For we are exceedingly filled with contempt. Our soul is exceedingly filled with the scorning of those that are at ease and with the contempt of the proud. You keep on looking unto the Lord. Isaiah chapter 8 verse 17. I said chapter 8, verse 17. And I will wait. Anytime you see, I will. If a man is saying that, and a man is saying that towards God, is showing his decision. And this was the decision of this man. And I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Israel. And I will look for him. I will look for him. You see the decision of the people that went before us. This is how the other people dealt with God. This is how they responded to God. And this is how they acted towards God. And we here today will say that we know about salvation. Why shouldn't we behave like they behaved? 
and we say we know about sanctification, about holiness and humility. Why shouldn't we act like they acted? And we say we know about the grace of God and the favor of God who gave his only begotten son to die for us. If he gave so much for us, why? If the Lord is correcting us for something, why shouldn't we look for God and wait upon God? and seek the face of the Lord and we know what he requires from us and then we say like these people I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob is hiding his face it's not answering our prayer it's not even showing us a favor and there's a reason for that because he wasn't doing like that before and now that we see he's hiding his face from us what are we going to do are we going to say okay if, if he is hiding his face if he does if god doesn't have any attention for me i don't have attention for him too i have a lot of things to do in my life who even cares whether he looks at us or not no, the, the people of old who are forgiven and saved and sanctified and committed and consecrated to God, they didn't act that way. They said, no, he's siding his face from us. He is right and we are wrong and we are going to seek the face of the Lord. I will look for him. We're looking at Micah chapter 7. Micah chapter 7. We're to look unto the Lord and we're to seek the face of the Lord and we are to allow his chastening rod to have the right effect and the right impact in our lives. In Micah chapter 7 verses 6 and 7 For the son dishonoreth the father. The daughter rises up against her mother. The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies is at the men of his own house. Therefore I will look unto the Lord that Jesus says there's confusion everywhere, there's commotion, there's confrontation everywhere. But all the same as for me, I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. The, my God will hear me. He will hear us. I said he will hear us. In Psalm 34, we're reading from verses 4 through to 6. Psalm 34. And we're reading from verse 4. Psalm 34, reading from verse 4. I sought the Lord, and he heard me. He will hear you. Yeah. And he delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto him in their distress, in their problem, in the pressures, and in the chastisement. And when the hand of God was heavy upon them, they looked unto him and were lighting, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Out of how many of his troubles? All, all his troubles. As we look at this, uh, Jonah, uh, what are we learning from Jonah? Number one, he remembered the forgotten call. He remembered the forgotten call. And that's what the Lord is wanting us to do. The Lord is not interested in chastising us. He doesn't take pleasure in chastising any of his children, even any of his creatures. But he wants us to, number one, remember the forgotten call. Number two, to repent of his former conduct. That's all, all that God wanted. And that's what the Lord is expecting from us, that if there's any conduct, any behavior, any lifestyle, any attitude that wasn't right, you repent of your former conduct. Number three, to return to the forsaken commission. You return to the forsaken commission. And you are telling the Lord, oh Lord, I will return. I will return. I will return to the commission that you gave me. I know what you want me to do. And Lord, the rest of my life will be to glorify your name. Number four, to reunite with your first companion. If you have driven away your first wife, your first companion, or your first husband, you're separated, and the Lord is chastising you, and you know that you go this way, there's blockage. You go that way, there's roadblock. You go the other way, and there's no way to move. And then the Lord is saying, you're saying, oh Lord, but what will I do? I'm serving you. I'm a child of God. It says, yes, but you're not with your first companion. And you need to make restitution. And he's saying, the reason why my hand is upon you is because you have abandoned your first companion. You reunite with your first companion. Number five, you reaffirm your firm conviction. Reaffirm your firm conviction. What conviction did you have many years ago? 
that God is a holy God and he demands holiness, return to that conviction. What conviction did you have when you came to know the Lord that my life, the only thing I can do in my life to be happy, the only thing I can do in my life to really be in the favor of God is to be at the center of the will of God. That's the conviction. Then you will go back and you will reaffirm that firm conviction. And what's your conviction? Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Wasn't that your conviction? Are you living that holy life consistently now? Or are there times you do things that are against holiness? In your action, in your attitude, in your behavior, in your conduct, in your lifestyle. And you even influence other people to act and work and live and behave against the holiness standard of the word of God. What's your conviction? Your firm conviction is that you follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Then you reaffirm. That firm conviction, you come back to the Lord. Oh Lord, I become careless. I wasn't doing like this before. I wasn't talking like this before. I wasn't dressing like this before. I wasn't behaving like this before. My firm conviction is that holiness becomes thy house. Oh Lord, and I'm reaffirming that firm conviction. And then number six is to revive your feeble, fading conscience. To revive your feeble Fading conscience. And you know how your conscience was when you were strong in conviction many years ago. If you did anything wrong, if you said anything wrong, if you went any way that was wrong, if you touched anything that brought immoral thoughts into your mind, you remember how you were trembled and your conscience was very, very sensitive and sharp. Why don't you then revive the feeble conscience and that fading conscience and then bring your conscience back again? And you are wondering, what kind of conscience does a prophet have to go away from God and to pay money into, to the sailors, the mariners, and then to go into that ship and with all the storm that was raging to sleep in that place? What kind of, uh, what kind of conscience did he have? The conscience has become feeble and fading and fainting. And now if you're going to come back to the Lord, you revive your feeble, fainting, fading conscience. Number seven is to renew your full consecration. To renew your full consecration. Everything you laid on the altar before, that's what the Lord is expecting. That now that the Lord is dealing with you and you say you've made your confession and you have taken your decision. Then your decision should come out in a very clear way that now you renew your full consecration. You will do it. Yeah. And the blessing of God will be upon you. Yeah. We come to the last point now. This is point number three. It's consecration and deliverance. It's consecration and deliverance. We're looking at Jonah chapter 2 reading from verse 7. When my soul fainted within me, I, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in unto thee, into thy holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. Jonah said, I realized what had happened to me. I observed lying vanities, vain things, lies, things that are not true, false things. And therefore I forsook my own mercy. I will, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Look at the result. And the Lord spake unto the fish. And the Lord spake unto the fish. But the Lord did not speak unto the fish until the man spoke unto God. Let's understand. Jonah, your problem is not the fish. You cannot fight against this fish because the fish is just doing the absolute will of God. And the fish cannot do any other thing except to hold you inside until the Lord will speak to the fish. It's like Balaam beating the ass. It's like Balaam saying, if I had a sword in my hand, you ass, I would have killed you because you have mocked me these three times. And the ass said, what's my fault? You are not seeing what I'm seeing. You are not under the power under which I am. And then God opened the eyes of Balaam and he saw the angel. And the angel said, why are you beating the ass? What has the ass done? The ass is just carrying out the will of God. 
The same thing, when you get into a problem, instead of blaming this man and blaming that woman and blaming this one and blaming that one, they're just doing the will of God. And when you speak to God and God knows that you're all right, then he will speak to the fish. And he will speak to the people concerned in the, in the situation. The Lord spake unto the fish and he vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. And now on, on what basis? Look at verse 9 again. I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. I will pay that that I have vowed. You see many people uh, do not understand vows in the Bible. They do not understand vows in the word of God. One, there is, a pro there is a vow of the prophet. The vow of the prophet. What's the vow of the prophet? Numbers chapter 22. Numbers chapter 22. Reading from verse 38. And Balaam said unto Balak, Lo, I am come unto thee. Have I now any power at all to say anything? The word that God putteth in my mouth, that shall I speak. That's a vow. That's a vow. When a minister is appointed by God, he needs to make consecration. He needs to make a vow. Oh Lord, you have called me. You have commissioned me. You have appointed me and you have ordained me to go and preach your word. Here is my vow. I will speak the word that God puts in my mouth. In 1 Samuel chapter 12. 1 Samuel chapter 12. Reading from verse 23. 1 Samuel chapter 12 verse 23. Moreover, as for me, God forbid... That I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will. That's a vow now, that's a vow, that's a consecration. I will teach you the good and the right way. That's a vow. As a leader, as a Christian worker, as a soul winner, as a minister of the gospel, the vow that we need to come back to is that. I will teach you the good and the right way. First Kings chapter 22. In First Kings chapter 22, verse 14. First Kings 22, verse 14. And Micaiah said, As the Lord liveth, what the Lord says unto me, that I will speak. What the Lord says unto me, that I I will speak. Come back to Jonah chapter 2 verse 9. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. I will pay my vow. I will pay my vow. Uh, let's, uh, that word pay. That means you're giving something. You're a preacher. You pay a debt. Because Paul the Apostle said, I'm a debtor, both to the Jews and to the Greek. And as a debtor, I have a debt to pay. What's the debt you are going to pay? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And that gospel I will declare unto the people. That's the debt you pay as a soul winner, as a preacher, as a minister, and as a prophet of God. But when it comes to paying your vow, there's another side to it. Look at Genesis chapter 28, paying your vow. Genesis chapter 28, reading from verse 20. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my God. He vowed a vow. This is a vow. The Lord will be my God. I will not backslide. That's vow. I will not go away from the Lord. That's the vow. I will remain with the Lord. I will continue with the Lord. That's the vow. Verse 22. And this stone 
that I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. I will build a sanctuary, a temple, the house of God. And then, and of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenths unto thee. That's the vow. You bless me, Lord. Of all that you'll give me, small or great, I'll give a tenth, my tithe. That I will give regularly to you. That's the vow. The vow of the believer. Not only that, I'll build the temple, the sanctuary. And as we have made that vow, we need to pay that that we have vowed. You see, sometimes, there are times you have so, said something to the Lord and say, Lord, we're building the sanctuary. We're building the temple of God. We're building the house of God. Lord, here is what I will do. And then in the first month and the second month, you do a little of it. And then the third and fourth and, you know, after that, then you forget all about it. And then you look at your life and you see where are the blessings that the Lord said he will give me. And you see that the blessings are missing. The Lord is telling you like, do you not come back? And you promise the Lord, I will sacrifice unto the Lord. It's a sacrifice. It's not going to be convenient all the time. I will pay that that I have vowed. Psalm 22. In Psalm 22, we're reading from verse 25. Psalm 22, verse 25. In Psalm 22, verse 25, my praise shall be of thee. In the great congregation, I will pay my vows before them that fear him. I will pay my vows. Plural, I'll pay my vows. You see, that's what the Lord is challenging us with. And that's when the situation is going to change. The vows that you have made, spiritual, material, whatever, you pay your vows before the Lord. Psalm 66, I'm reading verse 13. 66, verse 13. I will go into thy house with burnt offerings. I will pay thee my vows. I will pay thee. You are not paying it to man. You are paying unto the Lord. You are not paying your vows because you are happy with your coordinator. You are happy with your local government pastor. You are happy with your region overseer. You are happy with your state overseer. You are happy with the headquarters. No, you are not paying it to man. You made a vow to God. It's the house of God we're building. It's the sanctuary of the Lord. And then you say, I'm a part of the congregation. I'm a part of the people of God. And the whole church is united together. We want to build this to the glory of God for the worship of the Lord. And then you as a part of that congregation, as a part of the people of God nationwide or even beyond the nation, then you said, this is what I will do. That's a vow. And then whether, you know, you are under discipline or you are not under discipline, whether you are officiating or you are not officiating, whether you are allowed to minister or you are not allowed to minister now, you made a vow to the Lord, I will pay thee my vows. We're looking at Psalm 76 verse 11. Psalm 76, verse 11. Vow and pay unto the Lord your God. You are paying it to the Lord. Vow and pay unto the Lord your God. Now, that also teaches us another thing. When people make the vow, they may make the vow in a region, in a state in Nigeria, or make the vow in a country here in Africa that we're all together joining hands together and we're building that sanctuary of the Lord at the headquarters church. And when that vow is paid, it's paid unto the Lord. If any region of Asia or state of Asia or national of Asia or local government pastor or anybody in the state or anybody in the country or anybody here at the headquarters, if he touches that thing, when you steal from the vow of the people, a vow is sacred. A vow is a sacred thing. When you steal from that, you destroy your life. You destroy your business. And if you're a minister, you destroy your ministry. And the Spirit of God cannot work with you because you touch that sacred sin. Don't you remember what happened when Achan took the consecrated sin? A vow is a consecrated sin. And whether it is in the district or it is in the zone or it is in the region or local government, when those vows are brought, then it's to be taken 
totally without stealing any from, anything from it, without diverting it to another sin. What has been given must be totally given. 76 again, verse 11. Vow and pay unto the Lord your God. Let all that be round about him bring presents unto him that ought to be feared. Well, to fear God enough will not touch that thing that people have given us vow. In uh, Psalm 50, Psalm 50, I'm reading from verse 14. Psalm 50, verse 14. All found to God thanksgiving and pay thy vows unto the Most High. Pay thy vows unto the Most High. And then call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me. There are many people that are saying, I don't understand the promises of God. They are not working today as they used to work because they said, call upon me and then I will hear you and then I'll deliver you and you will glorify me. And we read that in verse 15. Why did you jump verse 14? It says, pay thy vows unto the most high. And when you have paid your vows in verse 14 and then now call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me. Psalm 116. Psalm 116. I'm reading verse 18. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. I will pay my vows in the presence of all his people. What a great opportunity when we come to worship together in the presence of all the people. What have you vowed? What have you brought as an offering, as a present? Your tithes, your offering, and then everything you brought to the Lord, you raise it up in the presence of the people of God. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Deuteronomy chapter 12. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, we're looking at it from verse 11. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 11. Then there shall be a place which the Lord your God shall choose to cause his name to dwell there. There shall be a place which the Lord your God shall choose to put to cause his name to dwell there. See that in that place ye shall bring all that I command you your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes. In the place where God has put his name, where God has put his glory, where God is working mightily, where you are being fed with the word of God, and the heave offerings of your hand, and all your choice vows. All, not just part. In the place where God has put his name, in the place where the Lord is teaching you, and his presence is mightily, is mightily felt, it says, all your choice vows which ye vow unto the Lord. Look at verse 26 of that same Deuteronomy verse 11. Verse, uh, chapter 12, chapter 12, verse 26. Only thy holy things which thou hast and thy vows thou shalt take and go unto the place which the Lord shall choose. And go unto the place which the Lord shall choose. As we talk about uh, the um, headquarters building, which belongs to every one of us, uh, that's where the headquarters uh, place right now. And that's where the Bible study is coming to you, whether you are here in Lagos, or you are in the southwest, or you are in the middle belt, or you are in the northeast and uh, northwest, or you are in the south-south, or you are in the southeast in Nigeria. The word of God is coming to you right now from the headquarters church here. And you know that he has put his name here. Am I right? And then all of us in Africa, where you are now, whether you are in West Africa or Central Africa, or you are in East Africa or Southern Africa, the word of God is coming to you from the headquarters. And this is the place he has put his name. And then he says, now, we together, we're joining hands together, and we're building this sanctuary unto the Lord. You will bring your vows into that place which he has chosen. We'll be faithful to the Lord. And then look at Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20. I'm reading verse 25. Proverbs chapter 20 verse 25. It's a snare to the man who devoureth that which is holy. It's a snare. 
to that man that devoureth that which is holy, and after vows to make inquiry. After vows to make inquiry. You know what that means? It's like, you know, we already said, we're doing this for the Lord. And then the Spirit of God spoke to your heart. Every month, this is what I will do. And you made a vow to the Lord. And then after you made the, your vow to the Lord, then you begin to later make inquiry. Uh, by the way, I, uh, what's my house rent? Inquiry. By the way, how much am I spending really on food? By the way, do I still, um, will I be able to make the vow good after I do this and do this and do It's a snare unto a man that he would devour that which is holy. That vow is a holy thing, is a sacred thing. It belongs to the Lord. And for you to be making inquiry, can I do it, can I not do it? That's a snare. You will do it. And then when you do it, the Lord will answer your prayer. And the Lord will magnify himself in your life in Jesus' name. Am I just saying that? What does the scripture say? Look at it in Job chapter 22. Job chapter 22. We're looking at verse 27 and then verse 28. Thou shalt make thy prayer unto him, and he shall hear thee. I thought you'll say amen. amen. I'll give you another chance. I'll read that verse 27 again. Get ready. Thou shalt make thy prayers unto him, and he shall hear thee. Amen. And thou shalt pay thy vows. Amen. Thou shalt pay thy vows. Amen all over in all the locations where you are hearing my voice now you respond and thou shalt pay thy vows yeah. after that look at verse 20 after you pay your vows thou shalt also decree a thing and it shall be established unto thee yeah. you see it is connected with paying your vow it is connected with honoring the lord it is connected with releasing that holy sacred thing you have promised the lord when you release that and you pay your vows then it says thou shalt decree a thing and it shall be established unto thee and thy light shall shine the light shall shine upon thy ways yeah. And so here is what Jonah said. He said, I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed salvation of the Lord. He immediately he said, I will pay my vows. Then the Lord spoke to the whale and he said, go and drop Jonah in the right place. And the, and the fish vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Your troubles will be over. Yeah. And all those chastisements and oppression, as you decide you are going to follow the Lord and you will pay your vows, everything will be over. Yeah. Why don't you rise up now and pray to the Lord and say, Lord, I thank you for the Bible study today. Thank you, Lord, because of the challenge that you have given unto me. Thank you, Lord, because of all the things that I've learned today. I'm going to respond positively, actively. I'm not going to be passive about obedience to your word at all. You see the love of God and you see what the Lord is doing and you see how the Lord has taught us today. And the Lord is saying, come to the Lord. If there is any problem, if there is any chastisement, if there is any oppression, don't, uh, uh, don't accuse God and don't argue with God. Don't abuse, don't insult God, don't abandon God, don't fight God, don't attack God. Don't be arrogant and proud before the Lord and don't harass other people. Don't instigate other people to rebel against the Lord. Just come before the Lord and say, Lord, I surrender. Lord, I yield myself. Lord, I commit myself unto thee. You are coming and say, Lord, I acknowledge my sin. I abase myself. I'm asking for God's mercy. I agree to follow the Lord. I agree to serve the Lord. I will abstain from every appearance of evil, every appearance of sin, every appearance of disobedience. I awake and I'm going to act positively in obedience to the word of the Lord. And I'm going to help others, teach others, instruct others, admonish others. That they too will be obedient to the word of the Lord. Your consecration to speak the word of the Lord. Your consecration to serve the Lord. Your consecration to sacrifice whatever it is the Lord will require from you. Your consecration to keep nothing back. 
but to lay everything on the altar. Your consecration to pay your vow. The inspiration of the Spirit of God was upon you when you made that vow. If that inspiration of the Spirit is still there, you'll pay the vows very quickly. The influence of the Spirit of God was there when you made the vow. If that influence of the Spirit is still there, you will quickly, urgently, without delay, pay the vow. Your fellowship with the Lord was intact when you were making that vow. Yet the fellowship is still as real, as fresh, as it was when you made the vow. Then you will quickly, urgently, and excitedly, cheerfully pay that vow. I will pay that that I have vowed. And when you do, You'll decree a sin, and then the Lord will confirm it and affirm it. Pay your vows, and the Lord will answer your prayers.